Hey gang, and welcome back to another worksheet solutions walkthrough for the worksheet, Intro to Conjugated Systems and Olic Charges. Okay gang, welcome to the first worksheet solutions walkthrough of Organic Chemistry 2, and I'm so happy you're here on Geochem using it as your organic tool to help you conquer carbon. So if this is your first solutions walkthrough, they go a little bit like this. Every instructional video on Geochem has a guided worksheet with you know that's free and has answers also for free. But if those answers don't make sense, if you're left wanting more, a deeper explanation as to how those answers got arrived at, well, these videos exist. So if you're looking for explanations, you're in the right place. So in this video, we will go over this worksheet. I will be going through the problems, showing you how I arrived at the answers that you've already seen. Uh, so let's get to it. Okay, gang, in problem one of this worksheet, we ease into this new world of conjugation and tackling problems about conjugation. So we have these nine structures here and you were tasked with identifying whether each structure was conjugated or not conjugated. And you know, of course, for the explanation, I'm gonna identify on the structure how that is. You didn't have to do that, but that's what we're gonna do. So we're just gonna go row by row. So if we take a look up here, remember for conjugation, we're looking for a network of three or more atoms that have parallel p orbitals. Or in a rare case, we have to have um, an atom or something that can uh, you know, have a lone pair that it can throw parallel to those other p orbitals. So if we take a look up here, right? You know, I do see the break here. Remember, we're seeing mostly looking for a network of sp2 carbons, sp2 atoms. Well, I certainly see this carbon's sp2, 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 sp2. So that's even enough to get it conjugated, right? We don't get the full chain right here because this carbon right here is an sp3 loser, but we have four carbons right here, that's plenty. We needed just three, so this structure is absolutely conjugated, okay? You know what I'll even do? I'll just do checks and X's. So this is, in fact, conjugated, okay? Right here, moving right along, we do see one, two, three, four, sp2, 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 sp2. This structure is certainly conjugated. Okay, Ooh, and I realized I forgot something right here. I'm sorry, that changes the problem completely. So if we look at the one on the far right, we see two atoms right here that are in fact sp2, and you might think to yourself, okay, well, I don't see that carbon up top being a part of a double bond. However, think about the fact that it is a carbocation. Since it is a carbocation, right, it's hybridization, and I'll even be very explicit about it, we see three electron areas, three bonding areas. That carbon is in fact sp2, it has a p orbital, it's just empty. So this is conjugated because this atom is sp2. It has a p orbital that can be parallel to the other two. Those two are full. The third one just happens to be empty. Okay, moving right along. I think this one, you're getting the hang of it by now. We are in fact conjugated. We see a network of four atoms right there. Conjugation is present. This structure right here, kind of similar to this right here. I'm playing tricks, but I know you guys are better than that. You guys know my tricks, especially if you were here for OCHEM 1. This carbon right here, again, we see that we have this going on right here. It's a radical. Radicals, where do they stick their one lone unpaired electron? In a p orbital. So we see this is sp2. sp2, and this radical is in fact sp2. So we have three orbitals parallel to one another. This is a three atom conjugated network right here. It's very similar to up here, but instead of an empty p orbital, we have a p orbital that just houses that one lone electron. This is conjugated. Here, we see two, but then we see a breakage. So no conjugation going this way, right? I don't see, that's, that's a breaking point right there. We see two right here, but I see a breaking point right there. We don't see a consecutive network of atoms that are conjugated here. We just have little one, uh, little units of two. So this thing is unfortunately not conjugated, okay? We would need one of those double bonds to be a unit, like a carbon closer so they can alternate, okay? Down here, even just looking at this right here, I think you can see sp2, 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 but even this oxygen understands the importance of it throwing a lone pair to be parallel to all these p orbitals, whoops, right here. So we do get a nice conjugative effect across the whole ring. This atom has a lone pair that participates. The whole ring is in fact conjugated, but it even would be without the oxygen. Right here, classic example of 
doing it again. We see sp2, sp2. So if these are p orbitals, this lone pair is going to be aligned parallel to these p orbitals so it can connect the bridge for all these p orbitals. So because of the fact that this lone pair plays ball and aligns itself with the p orbitals on both sides of it, this is in fact conjugated. Energetic payoff is there. And I think last but not least, you can see we don't have it here. No consecutive string of sp2 atoms. So this does it for these nine gangs. Sorry if that was a little bit more of an explanation that needed to be, but this is such a, if we don't have this down, these you know, problems moving forward will be harder to explain. So that's problem one, on to two. Okay, gang, rolling into problem two, we'll tackle part A first. So when we look at these, or this problem, part A, we see in two, we've been given an acid-base reaction, two of them. We have this one right here, and we see this one right here. The H that is being picked off is identified. We see the same base is used in both reactions, and we are told that reaction two is more favorable than reaction one, and we're tasked with explaining why. So hopefully it's very obvious that the difference between here and here is that this is just plain old cyclohexane, and here we see we have some double bonds in the mix, but we know this is all about conjugation, right? And I think you can see we have a network of more than three sp2 atoms all in a row. We have a conjugated system here, and it's no surprise that we're using this position right here, right? And it doesn't, these two are equivalent. It doesn't matter that we're using the top one. Up here, there's nothing special going on, but in the bottom case, right, in the more favorable reaction, this is the allylic position. We know that's a special position that's adjacent to a double bond, right, when you're not a part of one. So that's the special position. That is the type of charge we are left with. And the reason why reaction two is more favorable than reaction one is because we have that allylic carbanion, right, to use some terminology, a negative charge on a carbon in the allylic position, this charge is not left on this carbon for it to, you know, bear itself. That is the case up top. That charge is static. It's not going anywhere. Down here, it's not static. The opposite. What we can actually do is draw resonance because of the fact that we have this lovely conjugation. I can have this, this lone pair become a double bond, to avoid breaking the octet rule, I will bounce this double bond as a lone pair up on that carbon right there. In drawing that resonance, right, tr always trust your arrows. I didn't touch this double bond at all down there. I made a double bond right here, and I have now a lone pair and a tr uh, negative charge as a result on that carbon. And if we did it once, we can do it twice. Not always, but in this case we can. I can make this electron pair a double bond Avoid break the, breaking the octet rule there by bouncing this up as a lone pair. And I can draw this resonance structure. And again, trust your arrows. Whoops. Didn't trust mine. There we go. So, gang, reaction two is greater than reaction, or you're more favorable than reaction one, right? And this is acid base. So let's use some acid base terminology. This is, in reaction two, we have a stronger acid. A more favorable reaction means this is a better. This is better at losing H+, better acid, because of the fact that our, if we compare our conjugate bases, right, this charge is happier in this situation than this situation because of the fact that there's resonance present. This charge is not stuck on that carbon alone. It's evenly distributed across this network of atoms right here. So it's always easier to lift a couch with a group of friends as opposed to yourself. So this charge is more stable in the conjugate base in reaction two meaning weaker, more stable conjugate base corresponds to a stronger acid. That is the long explanation as to why reaction two is more favor favorable than reaction one. So that's it for A, on to B. Okay, gang, now moving into the second part of problem two, we see we have a similar setup. We have two reactions. We are told which one is more favorable and it is our job to explain why that is the case. Okay, so if we take a look up here, very similar structures, but again, I think you can see we have some... Uh, double bonds present in the structure. So mechanistically in this reaction, just really quick to make sure we're all on the same page, we know OHs, right, from our OCHEM1 knowledge, they are amphoteric. They can be both a source of H+, and that oxygen can go ahead and pick up H+. We are in the presence of really strong acids, so you can just assume H+, is available and ready for the picking. So in both scenarios, the OH, whatever structure you're using, is going to grab H+, Electrons get dumped onto bromine. 
we have OH2 plus a good leaving group as opposed to OH, the mediocre one we would have had to start out with. And because we're in a polar protic environment, solvolysis does occur. So this is really what's happening in both scenarios, whether you have the double bonds present or not. And we're not, we're not gonna wait for bromine to attack. We're just showing the formation of the carbocation. Okay, so now that we've done that, I think you can see what we're up against. One situation, we have this carbocation secondary, and up here we have another secondary carbocation. So what's the difference? Well, the conjugation is the difference. I think you can see this positive charge, just like in the previous example, uh, the first in reaction one of the previous example, it's static. This is not going anywhere, right? We can't shift it, we can't draw resonance. It is stuck on this secondary carbon, and it is that secondary carbon's job to bear that burden. However, when we look at the first inch carbocation that is produced, right? I think you can see sp2, 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 and after that, you know, OH is improved to OH2 plus, and water leaves as a leaving group. Now we have a full conjugate. Uh, conjugated network. We have a p orbital. We have a p orbital. Now we have an sp2, um, an sp2 carbon that has a p orbital, which connects the linkage. Now we have a conjugated system, and of course now I just mucked that up. And I have to redraw it. But to explain, you know, to show this, why this intermediate is more favorable, it's because of resonance. So I can move this double bond towards the positive charge to then have this type of resonance. And I'll just draw a fresh new version of this down below because I could do the exact same resonance move but just on the other side of the structure. So because of this resonance, gang, here we go, I'm gonna gotta trust my arrows, right? This positive charge is not just on this secondary carbon. In fact, you can just picture it, a like slight hazy partial positive across this structure. They're all helping each other out. They're all taking a little bit of that positivity versus this situation up top in the, you know, the carbocation in reaction two, that positive charge is in one spot and one spot only. So because of the stability of this intermediate you produce, reaction one, much more favorable. It's gonna happen much more quickly than this one in reaction two. Okay, gang, that does it for problem two. Let's head into three. Okay, gang, instead of problem three, what I really meant was problem two part C, the third part of problem two. Okay, so again, same format. We're given two types of reactions, and you can clearly see what the difference is. One situation, we're going to produce something allylic, right? We've always been working with the allylic, uh, you know, whether it be an allylic carbanion, an allylic carbocation, now we're gonna do an allylic radical. So, if we look at this right here, we see that if we were doing some type of thermal cracking, basically I just picked a process that would produce a radical, right? If we have extreme heat, we're going to crack this CH bond, we'll have one electron going to hydrogen and the other going to carbon. That's right, I'm using a single-headed arrow to show one electron. And we see the exact same thing here as well. That's essentially what's happening. So you can see we have a radical electron here and a radical electron there. And those are unstable when they're left unpaired with a buddy, right, a second electron. We know that these are housed in p orbitals, so these are in fact sp2 carbons. So if we look up in reaction one, it's very standard, just a regular old cyclopentane ring with a radical, elect, uh, you know, elect, a carbon that has is housing a radical electron, and down here, same deal. Except we see this is in the allylic position, right? We see it's next door to two carbons, sp2, both a part of the double bond. So why is reaction two more favorable than, than reaction one? Same story, resonance. If we look at reaction two, we can see that. This carbon is not the only carbon that's you know bearing that radical electron. We can see that if I take this one electron and I show it coming in to form a double bond right here, this carbon can say, okay, I'm gonna take my one electron from this double bond and I'm going to form a double bond right here. We've only moved one electron from this double bond, so we have to show where the other one is going, and we can illustrate it going on to this carbon, the other carbon that was part of the original double bond, right, and this is resonance, so I'm drawing a double-headed arrow. So as a result, the resonance structure we can draw, only one this time, but still better than none, is this right here. So it's not this carbon that has to, you know, be in charge of taking care, you know, uh, taking on the burden of that instability caused by this unpaired radical electron. This carbon's helping out too. So you have two carbons sharing the burden 
versus one, that radical electron is spread out over a network of atoms in reaction two versus reaction one, which is why this is more favorable. It always comes down to resonance, and that is the beauty and stability that conjugation brings to the table. Okay, gang, I hope those were the answers you were looking for. If you're watching this video, that means you've paid uh, and supported Joe Kim financially, and I'm so you know, humbled, happy that you're using Joe Kim just to even you know, get to your uh, goal of conquering carbon, but hopefully these videos are giving you the answer you need, and I'm so glad you're watching this one, and I hope to see you in the next one. Uh, 